Thanks, Jen. I, um, I've never taken this role before. I was always the one introducing. But uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, I see a fellow clear in the back there, right here. So why don't you come down? And we'll get this started. And what I always did was I, uh, was I started off by saying good morning. All right, how about good afternoon? Can I hear it back? Good That's much better. Thank you. <clears throat> Part of, as Jen mentioned, um, what, uh, what business is all about and what entrepreneurship is all about is relationships. And um, that's one of the things that you'll want to uh, remember and figure out who your relationships are, how they can help you, and how you can help them, because it's a two-way street. But um, my experience, and Jen said to elaborate on this a little bit, is that I, <clears throat> I have an MBA from the University of Utah. I have a bachelor's in science, a political science, and a bachelor's in finance. With that, I um, became a bank examiner, national bank examiner, and worked, went to work for Zions Bank as a commercial lender, handling what we used to call the big boy loans down at the head office. <coughs> um, success brings people wanting you to move, and um, so I had the opportunity to become the uh, president of Prudential Service Corp. That was a, f a savings loan in those days. And you don't see many of them around anymore with the changes in the environment. But um, I left uh, there and went to work for Prousewood, a local condominium developer as their financial vice president. From there, I thought, well, I can do this. So I got into the development business. I had a, a broker's license, and um, as well, we developed uh, several projects around Salt Lake, including Shady Brook Condominiums, uh, Hidden Village, Countryside, the San Francisco Condominiums down by Taylorsville High School. Uh, there's an office building at uh, 3450 Highland Drive, right next to Home Depot. When we did it, um, Home Depot wasn't there, and there wasn't a stoplight. But uh, life changes, and um, as the city grows, uh, so, do your, um, so do the projects that you did. But uh, in addition, uh, developed apartments, and along with condominiums, and um, have uh, little or no involvement in any of that today. I, uh, I left there and got back into banking, and the reason I left there was because of um, partners and uh, some of the things that happened in the, uh, in the economy. I had to file a bankruptcy. And um, so I never did go back into development, went back into banking. I became uh, head of the small business uh, er uh, department at Holiday Bank and uh, was a director of that bank. And uh, then came back to Zions and headed their SBA department. And we, came <coughs> we became number one in SBA lending, which was kind of a fun thing to see happen. Realizing that no one is, no one is totally on their own. It requires a lot of people, a lot of uh, teams in any organization. And even there, it's all about the relationships with the people that you work with. Uh, from there, I uh, was asked to go to Bank of the West and be their regional uh, administrator of uh, SBA loans. That included uh, Wyoming, Utah, uh, Southern Nevada, and ended up uh, getting assigned to take uh, Los Angeles, uh, which was when, uh, when my boss from San Francisco asked me about that, I said, 
So you want me to move to L.A.? He said, no, you can manage it from Salt Lake. I said, that, that doesn't necessarily work. But um, I was close to retirement, and uh, so I took that uh, avenue. I still, um, ha I still spent some time uh, helping uh, banks and um, advising them, but uh, my main passion since I, uh, since I retired was uh, fly fishing and golf. And um, one day we're sitting around the uh, table uh, having a hamburger after playing 18, and somebody said to me, I don't know, what are you going to do the rest of the day? And I couldn't think of anything that was productive, and uh, so somebody uh, pointed me out to Salt Lake Community College, <coughs> where I become an where I become an adjunct professor. This uh, semester, I'm teaching critical thinking, uh, which is uh, Foundations of Business 1050, an intro to, intro to business class, and also uh, the entrepreneurship class. So with that uh, small an introduction, um, I want you to know that I'm happy to be here. I enjoy, uh, I enjoy uh, the student interaction, and um, I, uh, I get excited as I, as I meet the students to uh, see where they're going and what they're doing. And I learn probably more from the students than I'm able to teach them. Um, one of those things that uh, I didn't really have to have too much computer involvement because I always had people that helped me. But since I've come out to the college, I've had to learn a lot about the computer. So this has been, this has been a lot of fun for me. Uh, sometimes frustrating, but a lot of fun. So with that, um, I, want to, um, I want to make you uh, think critically for a little while. So on the board here, um, I have a presentation from a Princeton uh, <coughs> man who uh, is named Angus uh, Deaton. He won a Nobel Prize, and uh, he's an economist. And the, and the uh, the premise of what we want to talk about, if 40% of Americans aren't working, what are they doing? <coughs> now, it says the most recent job numbers uh, mask a pretty dark story. They say unemployment, they say, is around 5.5%, but uh, only 59% of, um, of Americans have a job. And uh, the difference in, uh, in, uh, is the unemployment rate that only counts uh, who wants to, uh, people who want to work. And uh, the labor force uh, is perhaps the most, the participation rate is perhaps the most uh, accurate gauge of the economy. It includes people who've given up, don't want to, or can't work. And it fell to 62.4% last quarter. Labor force participation has fallen steadily since the start of the recession of 2008. I think you probably remember that recession. Um, so, and it hasn't, uh, it hasn't been that low since 1977. And back then it was still common for uh, for women to be homemakers, so there weren't women in the workforce. But uh, the low labor per, uh, participation rate has got Fed watchers talking about uh, maybe an interest rate uh, hike in December that uh, they're talking about. They're saying that's probably going to be too soon. We are not as strong as uh, we think we are. So. Some of the things that uh, I wanted you to see is uh, the labor participation by age. Now, you've got uh, the, uh, it's kind of a pink line, it's uh, this, the 16 to 24 percent, 
or 24 years old, and then you've got the 25 to 54 year old, which is the strongest line. Then you've got the 55 to 64 rate, which is, uh, and they're all on a little bit of a decline. So as you, uh, as you look forward to this, you can look at it two ways. You say, well, the labor, the, uh, labor situation is terrible. But on the other hand, it's great. There's a lot of demand for people that want to work. And so it, uh, it's kind of an interesting dichotomy. So if you train yourself for jobs, if you get into a specific field and like it, your chance of success is very good. One thing that uh, I would point out to you as an entrepreneur or as, as a, an employer, employee of a company, is that you uh, do your best and look forward, always looking to the next job or the next opportunity. And that's what, um, that's what successful peop business people do. They're watching the, watching the uh, shop that they're in, keeping track of it on a short-term basis, but they're also keeping in mind long-term goals. And um, so with those things in mind, I've got a, uh, in, my, in my entrepreneurship class, I have a 16-unit lecture called Stanford Startups. And um, so if we go over to this, these are, uh, this is done by Stanford University. And um, they talk a little bit about number one perception. And, um, and you say, what is a great founder of a small business of, or an entrepreneur? So I'm going to start that. The perception of what a great founder is. And classically, you know, this tends to be Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos. And it's an image of founder as superwoman or superman, right? Who is, has this like panopticon of skills. And I can use the word panopticon because I'm here at Stanford. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, it's, it's things like, I know how to do product market fit. I'm great at product, I'm great at strategy, I'm great at management, I can fundraise, <laughs> right? I can do all of these different skills. And a part of what you're looking for in a great founder, in the kind of theory of the founder as super person, is I'm looking for someone who is awesome at all of these things. They're, they're, they're well-rounded, they're diverse, they can bat on all skills. And uh, you know, part of how I found this kind of emphasized in my own, mm -hmm the beginning of my own entrepreneurial journey, as I remember reading an article that said, you know, Bill Gates who is smarter than Einstein, right? And you're like, well, look, Bill Gates is really smart and is very accomplished, but I'm not quite sure smarter than Einstein is actually a phrase that even Bill would want to be actually next to. <laughs> uh, and it's partially because I think it's this image of founder as super person, which is that a great founder is someone who can do anything, you know, jump over tall, uh, tall buildings in a single bound, you know, all of these sorts of things. And the reality, <laughs> right? There's, uh, there's the reality of Superman. He's got his head in his computer and he's looking at his numbers is a founder is someone who deals with a ton of different headaches. And, um, and no one is universally superpowered. Uh, generally speaking, you hope to have a couple of superpowers, some things that are unique edge to you, some things that are unique to the problem that you're trying to solve, uh, some things that uh, may help you give an edge because actually competitive differentiation and competitive edge is super important. But, uh, but it's, not, uh, it's not actually in fact a, a function of of genius, and matter of fact, uh, frequently, it's very hard to tell the difference between madness and genius because uh, usually it's the results that play out. And sometimes, when you're dealing with uncertain environments, you may even be genius and later be thought to be a, a mad person, or you may be a mad person and you turn out to be lucky, and you're later thought to be a genius. So it's it's actually a kind of a challenging set of like, how do you think about, you know, these sets? You know, what is the whole set of skills? And when us mere mortals you know, come into this kind of battle, what is the way, right way to think about it? And so, 
Um, you know, when I thought about this question of how is one a great founder, you know, part of what you get to is, oh, and actually this is probably the slide that for um, people on, uh, this, this may have been a suboptimal choice for people on video, but it's like, these are all skills that are super important, right? These are all things that you say, well, okay, this is, this is really, really important to do, and you, you must, that, okay? in fact, actually do this well, and it begins to look like a superhuman task. And so what I did is I decided to take a, a subset of these uh, and focus on some of the, th the interesting things to think about what is it that actually makes a great founder? Because it's actually not that you score 10 out of 10 on all of these, you know, you're the, the entrepreneurial Olympiad, right? You, you are actually the best at all of these things. So let's start with team. So one way to kind of, I think, talk about exploding the kind of the myth of the super founder is that actually, in fact, usually it's best to have two or three people on a team rather than a solar founder. It's not that, let's say, solar founders don't actually play out and they can uh, successfully. But most often, two or three people is actually, in fact, a much better. When I look at these things as an investor and I say, you know, uh, what is a good composition of a project and, a, and founders that are likely to succeed? So what he's saying is you're not alone. You're better off to put together a team, aren't you? <clears throat> That would be uh, one of the things when uh, in development or whether uh, when I was in development, we had a team of players. And not all the uh, players were um, on the same page. And uh, when you're not on the same page and you're dealing in a, a very diverse and uh, fast moving economy, it can be positive in some ways and very negative in others. So. That team is important. You want to know that team as well as you know yourself. And that uh, can be very difficult, but it is an essential part of it. The next thing I want to uh, bring up is that uh, he talks about location. And, um, uh, and so frequently, I've heard told to me, it's like, oh, Silicon Valley aggregates all of this uh, super talent, which it does. Uh, in terms of like what what actually in fact it's it's the reason why Silicon Valley uh, startups are so successful is because all of these great people immigration which is hugely important for for talent and founders and everything else you know emigrate here and that's part of the reason now it's actually if you think about it from basic math n even if you take something that that Silicon Valley is super strong at which is essentially software uh, skills in the last uh, two decades. Not all of the great software people move here. N not all of them can move here. There are many of them in various other parts of the world. And, and so why do I put choice of location as one of the things that comes down to thinking about whether or not you're a great founder? Well, the reason is, is because what great founders do is seek the networks that will be essential to their problem and their task. And they realize that it isn't just about like, kind of like, I am super person, I can do this anywhere. I can do this, you know, in, you know, the Antarctic, <laughs> et cetera. It's in order to be successful, I have to go to where the strongest networks are for the particular kind of problem or the particular kind of thing that I'm doing. And Silicon Valley, by the way, is super good at some uh, kind of tasks, some places that you essentially try to uh, solve certain kinds of problems, but it is not good at all of them. Let me take, you know, kind of two examples. So one is Groupon. I don't think Groupon could have ever been founded here. Even though it's a software product, it actually even generates a network, which, you know, obviously a lot of the great networks are here, and, uh, and uses a um, uh, kind of internet technologies, a mobile product, and everything else, all of which we have a lot of great skills here in Silicon Valley, and the networks are really good for this. One of the things that's central for Groupon for its early days was having massive sales forces. And massive sales forces, strengths and weaknesses of networks tend to go together. Silicon Valley tends to be pretty adverse to plans that involve like, oh, we're going to uh, rent a 25-story building, and in 20 of those stories, we're going to have floors of salespeople, and that's how we're going to get our thing going. 
That kind of plan here tends to not get a lot of interest, tends to get a lot of criticism, tends to not have talent aggregate to it, tends to have financiers talk about things like capital efficiency and network effects and other kinds of things that are, that are key here. And so it's actually not a surprise that actually, in fact, Groupon require, was required to be actually in Chicago, which is really good at this, as a way of actually kind of getting going and, and showing that even software startups can be in other places. Next question. So location, a lot depends on what you're doing and um, what your uh, market area is. Because it's all about the market. And the next question you should ask yourself, uh, should I do the work or should I delegate it? Have, uh, have any of you got any thoughts on this? Should I do it all myself or should I delegate? Everybody needs help, don't they? Said there's no way that you can do it all yourself. You find that there aren't, you have 24 hours in the day. You're an entrepreneur 24 seven, but it goes beyond that scope. And you need to, uh, <clears throat> whether you have partners, they need to do certain things and you need to stay in communication, but you also need to uh, delegate to uh, people that work for you. When you bring someone in and uh, hire them as uh, whatever that function that they're going to do, uh, keep in mind that you don't want to hire them unless you can make more money off of them uh, than you're paying them. And that can be a little frustrating to the employee. So there's a lot of uh, reward systems that uh, can work. Um, one of the best seems to be giving that employer a uh, minimum salary that can cover the basic needs and giving them incentives. That could be commission if they're in sales. It could be performance bonuses, these kinds of things. So that's, uh, that's another very strong consideration. This is always a uh, this is always a good one. It's should I be flexible or persistent? And I'm going to open this up for just a second. And um, that slinky doesn't look very uh, inflexible, does he? but a slinky can get down the stairs, it just keeps going. This is actually classic when you begin thinking about what is a great founder, is you navigate what is apparent paradoxes. So another one that I frequently talk about is, you gotta be both flexible and persistent. And the reason for this is, entrepreneurs are frequently given the advice to you know, have a vision, stay firm against adversity, you know, realize that you, you, you have this vision that is contrarian to what other people think, and just stay on track, get through the difficult times and get there. The other piece of advice given with equal vigor is uh, listen to data, listen to customers, uh, pivot, be flexible. <laughs> right? Part of the thing this comes out to being in terms of being a great founder is to say, well, when should I be persistent? When should I be flexible? And the, the vehicle that I most often use for this is you should have on a project you're doing, like a company, an investment thesis that essentially says why you think possibly contrarian, why you think this is potentially a good idea. It should include what you know that you think other people don't know. And then, as you're going into the battlefield, you go, is, you know, am I in fact increasing confidence in my investment thesis or decreasing confidence in my investment thesis? Because if I'm increasing confidence, then hope, oh, stay on track, you know, be persistent. And by the way, sometimes even with adversity, your confidence can, can increase. If it's decreasing, that doesn't mean jump out. Uh, PayPal, LinkedIn, uh, Airbnb, a whole bunch of startups I've been, a, uh, I've been part of have had months where you were like, oh my God, this, why did we ever think this was a good idea? It was kind of a valley of the shadows moment. So like, for example, in PayPal, it was you know, August 2000, we were burning $12 million in one month. The, the expense curve was exponentiating. We had no revenue. Decrease in confidence. However, we say, okay, what do we do in order to fix that? And that gives you your immediate action plan. Another one is, 
Should you have belief or should you have fear? Right? Should you have, you know, could, could you, should you essentially go, well, no, no, I, I have this vision of the way the world should be and I should ignore everything else and I should just go at that. Well, again, part of what being a great founder is, is being both able to hold the belief, to think about where it is you want to be doing and where you want to be going, but also be smart enough that you're essentially listening to criticism, uh, negative feedback, uh, competitive entries, where you're kind of going, okay, is this changing my investment thesis? Is this changing what I'm planning on doing? And it doesn't mean you lose confidence. You have the confidence, but you also essentially have the peril. Again, in this kind of thing of how do you put these two things So if you're a founder, how many think you should work by vision? How many think you should work by data? Show of hands. Vision. Okay. How about data? Okay. What's the difference? What is it? You have to have time. You have to be able to analyze the data, don't you? But um, you still need a vision of where you're going? Yeah. And uh, the data should uh, tell you whether you're going the right way. When you talk about industry, they talk about businesses that are on the rise, industries that are on the rise. They talk about businesses that have flattened out and uh, businesses that they don't consider having a lot of growth. And then they talk about those industries that are declining. So when you choose something to do, find out what kind of an industry you're going into. Being into, into an industry that's declining is probably not your best bet. But the data that you pull up will show you whether that uh, business is growing or declining or staying level. Here's another one that's kind of classic, which is, well, should I have this long-term vision? Or Where should your focus be? Short-term, long-term. Long-term focus, set long-term goals. What's long-term? Five years is a long-term. And uh, when we look at uh, business plans in the bank, we'd say, well, I know you're going to make money in five years because your projections show that you will. But that, that may not necessarily be the case. I've never seen a projection that uh, showed a loss in the first couple of years. But uh, the results after the loan was made showed that, yes, in fact, there were losses in the first couple of years. Then you're in a situation where you have to explain in the shorter term how you get out of that loss side into the profit side. But always have a five-year goal in mind. And what would be a short-term uh, measure? You could do it depending on, the, depending on the business you're in. It could be daily, could be weekly, could be monthly quarterly, but definitely annually. Part of that is because you got to report for taxes every year. So that would be your, um, that would be your minimum short-term goal, but um, I, think, uh, <clears throat> I think your short-term goal should uh, give you that indication of how am I, how am I uh, moving toward my long-term goals. And um, I thought the targets are appropriate because if you look at that, you'd say, well, part of this is uh, my long-term goal might be down here and it might have one arrow in it. My short-term goal may be on the other side and you're not necessarily always in that target that you want to be. So... <clears throat> If you're not within that target, then that's when you make adjustments. One of the critical things 
is that um, always uh, you've got to know yourself. Got to know who you are, what your strengths and weaknesses are, what your talents are. And um, you got to say, how do I know if I'm being a great founder? How do I know if I can be a great founder? Well, there's a lot of uh, aptitude tests you can take and, and uh, figure out what your talents are. And some of them may, uh, may lead you in uh, directions that you didn't really understand or think that was possible. But you show an aptitude or a talent for that area. It's, um, <coughs> it's been proven by, uh, by many different companies that the uh, talents and skills that you have can lead to your success. Some of the reasons are that, number one, you're good at it. Number two, you like it. And um, those, are both, uh, those are both critical things. <coughs> My wife asked me when, uh, when we failed in business and I had, to I had to file a bankruptcy in the development world, she said, Rick, if you had it to do over, would you do it again? And I said, yeah, I would. It was a great run, and even though we failed for whatever reason, it was worth the ride. And um, it cost me a whole hell of a lot more money than my uh, cost of the college did. But uh, at the same time, I learned a lot of great lessons. You can learn from your mistakes, from your failures, and you can still do those things that you want to do. The idea is that you get back up on your feet after a failure. It's like riding a bike. When you're five, you don't always uh, start off riding that bike down all the way down to the end of the street. You're going to scuff your knees. You're going to uh, get a few bruises. But uh, when you do get riding that bike, it's a fun adventure and can lead to uh, other adventures. Sometimes it can lead to extreme adventures that can get you into some real trouble if you go riding off cliffs. But um, always keep that in mind, that you want to do something that you like, something that you're good at, and something that will bring you rewards beyond the monetary. The other thing I would encourage you to do, and this would be the last point, is to contribute th to the benefit of others. Now, and this is kind of fun about, uh, fun about, this is one of the things that's fun about being an old guy. I get to come out here and meet with young people. I get to learn new ideas. And, um, that includes you because you're you're younger than I am. I know that. So, but uh, I uh, I learn more from you than you learn from me. And as I give, I get rewarded by learning new ideas, new concepts, and make new friends. And keep that in mind as as your final objective. In uh, that. Make this a lifelong ride. Ride that bike, don't take it over the cliff, but take it into some great places. Okay, I, uh, I always thought at that time that the money managers were the only ones that benefited from, uh, some, of those, uh, from some of those pools. But um, regulation has changed that a lot and uh, made it more beneficial to the uh, investor. I still question a lot of times when I get a, uh, a fixed income uh, rate, uh, what, uh, what the yield that's going in there on the prospectus, it doesn't always show what's not coming through <laughs> to the investor. If I'm making uh, four to five percent, I'm, I'm thinking, well, how much is it really making? And um, that's when you, uh, the one thing about it on that side is that 
you have no control of that as a financial planner. And what you're doing is recommending to friends, neighbors, family, and you're giving them advice. Now, they're not going to go back to Wall Street and beat up on somebody on the uh, 32nd floor. They're going to come to your house if that uh, thing goes bad. So that's one thing that you want to consider. But uh, is it interesting? Yes. The other problem that we have here is that you're not on the, on, you're not on the trading floor. You're not getting the second to second information. You're getting it a couple hours later, if you, if you will. So things to consider as you look at that. But a great uh, financial planners and uh, brokers are, uh, that's, a great, that's a great field. The question is, what kind of a position does a person uh, need to be in to get a small business loan? Recognize that if you, if you go in for a small business loan, they're typically guaranteed by the government. Some, depending on the incentive program and what the government wants to develop, you can get a 100% loan. Typically on small business, you get a 90% loan and you have to come up with 10% of the cash. So a 90-10 loan is uh, pretty desirable compared to a standard conventional loan who uh, would be 50 to 75% loan to uh, cash and investment. When you get a small business loan, what they would do is um, they'll take uh, all of your assets and you'll personally guarantee it. Your assets may not be strong, but what you have to do, like anything else, is weigh the risk. If I own a home and I have 30% equity in it, according to appraisal, uh, and uh, my loan goes south, they can come and get your house. They can get your car. They can get all of your, all of your assets if you fail. But uh, in the bank, uh, the bank benefits because the uh, government will pay the uh, balance of that, uh, of that loss if it's done right. Um, the other side of it is, is the lending side is getting an investor. Now, SBA loans, the last time I checked, were in the 4% range. And uh, Prime is in the 4.25 last time I looked, but I, and I don't think it's changed. But an investor, the advantage of getting an investor is that you don't have to pay the investor back. But the investor is going to want more than the 4.25% for his investment. So there's a cost involved in getting an investor into your business. He's going to want a piece of the ownership. If you have a very successful business and he wants, <coughs> excuse me, if he wants 50% uh, of it for his uh, equity contribution, uh, then um, that's, uh, and, and your business uh, goes up 10 to 15 times in value and you sell it to another business, uh, you sell it to another company, then uh, you could have, uh, you could have uh, passed up on a lot of money. Say a million dollar investment, you sell it for 15, and uh, you turn around and uh, you give him seven and a half. And if you do that in three years, that's a pretty expensive, uh, pretty expensive loan, isn't it? So that's the other side. But there are advantages to lending and there are advantages to investors. Look for Stanford startups. Yep, there's 16 lectures. Are they good? Yeah. I'll give you a lot of good information. And the people from Stanford are pretty smart. Sometimes they're not quite as practical for our environment, depending on what you want to do but uh, you can learn some great things from the Stanford startups. I would recommend that you pull up that lecture series. They're 
16 lectures, they run about an hour apiece, don't they? The question is, uh, how important is academics in the finance area? It can be very important in getting you a start. Uh, but beyond that, it's your performance when you get there. There's a lot of ways to get into that. If you don't have, uh, if you don't have that four-point average and you're not going to Wharton's, uh, there are a lot of other great schools. But with that, there are internships available that you can work on, uh, that you can work in various industries, and um, you can excel beyond, uh, beyond that guy that got the Wharton degree. So grade, uh, grades are very important, but they're not everything. Thanks for letting me talk.